good afternoon to you dear friends uh webinar topic today is shifting of telecom gears from evolution to revolution the journey of 5g while introducing the panelists here i'm actually introducing the veterans of this industry who have been through it through its thick and thin and also in the august company of our policy makers basically the dot the licensor represented by mr kishore babu who is our ddg for innovation and rnd and you will shortly be seeing from trai mr sk gupta secretary of trai from the industry uh, veterans uh, first and foremost mr tv ramachandran our president of the broadband india forum mr balaji who is the chief of regulatory and corporate affairs in vodafone mr amit marwa the head of marketing and corporate affairs in nokia mr tr dua will be also joining us shortly and myself i am chairing the foreign investors india forum it's a great pleasure being with you friends and i can see that there is a large audience telecom is an interesting story of from where to where and in, indeed we have come a long way from 25 years ago when we made our first call on 31st july 1995 at calcutta this was undoubtedly a momentous occasion which is etched in my memory as the call was between shri jyoti basu who was the chief minister of west bengal with uh, mr sukhram who was the telecom minister at the center and this call was on the modi telstra operator network supported by the technology and equipment provider network of nokia so this is something which is very much in our memory from those days and this in fact marked the beginning of the mobile telephony story in india it was from this historic date that when we count 25 years then on 31st july 2020 we are celebrating the silver jubilee year and the several functions around that little did we know at that time that in this period of 25 years we have today have become amongst the world's largest provider in terms of data consumption and also having the world's lowest data tariff as also today worldwide the second largest subscriber base for voice and data it is from uh, one can safely say that if we look at telecom and it soft, so software services in india it definitely represents the single biggest showpiece sector of our industry as a, as a competitive globalized world it this has happened undoubtedly due to the industry commitment and government policies both of the dot and the regulators which has helped in creating an enabling and supportive environment no doubt the industry has seen its ups and downs but solutions have always been found by interactions and dialogue and ultimately a group consensus no doubt some of these may have been later than sooner but so what we moved forward today we have a gathering of veterans who have been deeply involved in this growth story of ours and importantly will put peep into the future for which the organizers have rightly termed this session as telecom from evolution to revolution 2g to 3g to 4g has been the evolution of our mobile story but 5g undoubtedly will be revolutionary and a game changer and also a futuristic approach towards 6g before i turn to uh, my first question to our uh, participants i will uh, welcome mr tr dua he has just joined in mr tr dua is the director general of typa and he is amongst our six panelists who are there together i would have addressed ideally the first question with mr tr dua but we have the benefit so sorry to mr sk gupta he has yet to come in so i'll address my question to Mr. Kishore Babu, Kishore ji, uh, you have been driving R&D innovation in DOT and have been intrinsically connected with the policies. In the context of 5G, how do you see 
the excitement to be built up to the several possible use cases which would be relevant in the Indian context, both for the urban and rural India. Some comments from your side, please. So thank you very much for the question, Umangji. Uh, am I audible and clear to you? Yes, please. Thank you very much. And uh, first and foremost, uh, let me thank uh, uh, for hosting this webinar as well as the opportunity to share what is happening and uh, what we can work together and what are the areas of gaps and uh, how do we build more collaboration. Thanks very much to all of you. And uh, seeing the panelists here who are veterans and experts in their own domains who have been significantly contributing in policy making as well as uh, giving inputs for making the right choices and right approaches from the operators as well as associations and as well as the regulator and uh, the you know industry captains thanks once again to all of you for your valuable inputs when we prepared and you know launched national digital communication policy 2018 i can still see the enthusiasm as well as uh, the exuberance about uh, you know what this new telecom policy or digital communication policy is going to create new landscapes under this India program and what kind of new and uh, you know I should say let me call it as a both evolutionary as well as revolutionary changes the industry would experience by for taking these new upcoming as well as emerging services to the public and masses thanks very much and uh, we all have been hearing about 5g as one of the I should say the uh, path-breaking technology in terms of its uh, disruption capability along with AI and uh, which is denoted right now as one of the general purpose technologies so the moment you call it as a general purpose technology uh, it's it's uh, you know i mean uh, its landscape is unlimited and the scope is uh, huge i mean to which are the spheres and domains it can impact it could be social security and strategic as well as economic spheres the impact is going to be huge and uh, still we are assessing as well as use cases are being built under 3gpp as well as industry you know i mean labs about how we are going to use this technology. But coming to its deployment, as well as how it is going to be taken to the through operators to the public, I see three important areas which we all should remember. One is about usage cases and scale, how we are going to build it. And most importantly, the last one, investments. These three are important areas which we need to really consider and facilitate in terms of policy, as well as uh, taking forward in uh, building collaboration bridges. So usage cases is one of the, you know, I mean, pulls, demand pull, what is going to generate uh, from the users as well as industry, uh, which will enable operators to, you know, to invest significantly in this new technology, especially having seen the impact of digital communications in the recent uh, COVID times where uh, all of us, we are all the beneficiaries of uh, digital communication technologies in our work, in our entertainment, as well as the way we handled the stress during the last few months thanks very much for all your support we appreciate you know the grand cooperation you all extended you know in uh, 24 by 7 efforts from all of you in making communication available to the public as well as for governing functions thanks once again so in terms of usage cases i see especially the v2x where we have got a lot of uh, you know automobile sector i mean to say automobile sector is common for every country but however in our country when we look at the kind of indigenization is happening in the uh, automobile sector, the way so many ancillary industries have been built. And VTX could be one of the very important areas, IOTs, and as well as the, all the way the capabilities of 5G. We have seen about very low control plane latency, user plane latency, reliability, as well as uh, connection density, zero interruption time. These capabilities are going to impact hugely and contribute in agriculture, not only in uh, rural areas, in urban areas, in urban areas, especially for uh, smart cities, smart communities, and smart living, you name it, it's going to have any huge impact. And uh, we also have seen that, you know, industry veterans have come out with some of the test beds in, uh, you know, in their labs who are working with uh, startups as well as SME community. And uh, even uh, public sector bay access, we are having the IITs consortium, which is coming, uh, coming up with the Testbed infrastructure, which is going to be made available to the public in the coming months. All this infrastructure is going to, going to encourage innovation as well as R&D in terms of innovation capability, what we can bring onto the table to build strength and as well as build demand for these 5G services. And perhaps, you know, I mean, I can add more 
in the discussion further oman ji at this moment uh, these are my first cut inputs thanks very much so thank you very much kishor ji i think you have rightly brought out that there are several possibilities on use cases and the more and more they become relevant to our day to day requirements in the urban and rural sector it will build up the excitement for it and it will build up the policy initiatives which will lead to the implementation of 5g model thank you very much uh, kishor ji may i now uh, turn my attention to shri sk gupta he is a secretary trai gupta ji are you what are you audible to you hello mr gupta are we audible to you no gupta ji are we audible to you okay i think we'll come back to mr gupta meanwhile uh, turning my attention to our colleagues from the industry tv mr tv ramachandran very popularly known as tv to all of us Uh, he is a very visible fig figure in the industry, and uh, and uh, he has done a lot of yeoman's work right from the beginning. I'd like to ask a few TV that while we are all waiting for 5G to happen, undoubtedly you need a versatile ecosystem, and in that context, it is often said that digital infrastructure will play a key role in ensuring that the 5G services become. Uh, available to our consumers and customers at large so may i request your attention and to how do you see the uh, what do we mean by digital infrastructure what are the various components which constitute digital infrastructure which you believe will be important for the 5g ecosystem over to you thank you mang ji um, great pleasure to be here today with you all and i thank uh, et for this opportunity uh, your question is very good mr mang Uh, 5G is all about data because we are moving from the voice world to data. And what is digital? Digital is defined actually as that branch of engineering knowledge and practice which relates to usage of data, creation of data. So 5G is all about digital infrastructure. Without that, you cannot have data usage or creation. That being the case, when that defines digital and 5G, what is digital infrastructure? digital infrastructure becomes all the physical resources that are used for creation of data transmission of data consumption of data so all the resources that go into that is that constitutes digital infrastructure i wanted to first share that congruence with 5g and digital infrastructure and today it is well accepted that in today's society modern economy modern society this is very fundamental to have a, a robust digital infrastructure that's required even for the quality of life of our everyday living um, in that context if we look at it if it's important and what constitutes digital infrastructure i have uh, i i'd like to turn to the world's highest authority on telecom which is the itu international telecoms union geneva and look to them for their guidance on what is digital infrastructure they say very clearly in their policy document on digital infrastructure and that's not even a year old just about a year old they say it's a key to enabling the benefits of digital economy and they say that it includes all the physical and hardware and associated software also which enable end to end information and communications uh, infrastructure to operate Now that they list out also all the things, they list out internet backbone, they list out fixed communications infrastructure, they list out mobile networks infrastructure, including towers, OFC to care backhaul, etc. Then they go on to list satellite communications infrastructure, Wi-Fi infrastructure, even Internet of Things today, and most importantly, data centers. Can you imagine what we'd all do? for 5g or data if we didn't have data centers and today data centers are also moving to the edge so all these holistically constitute robust in uh, digital infrastructure and uh, moving from geneva closer home if you look at our own national digital communications policy architected by eminent friends like kishor babu ji who spent night and day on that 
there also, if you look at the first, very first chapter is Connect India. And under Connect India title, the subtitle is Creating a Robust Digital Communications in Infrastructure. So obviously, you can connect India only through robust digital infrastructure. And they go on to spell the elements of that and the goals in that. For example, they say very clearly that 50% of the households have to be connected by fiber by 2022. They go on to say that in uh, gram panchayats, all the gram panchayats by 2020, that is this year, should be connected with at least one GBPS connectivity. And by 2022 with 10 GBPS, they go on to say 5 million public Wi-Fi hotspots by 2020. 5 million, that is 50 lakhs. And 10 million by 2022. So, and strengthening of satellite communications infrastructure. And you heard the Honorable Finance Minister last month talk about strengthening satellite infrastructure, privatization, liberalization. So all these are on the cards, beautifully spelled out by policy, beautifully outlined by ITU. So these make up the robust digital infrastructure that we need. And your question also, where do we stand on that? India is making good progress, but I would say that we have a long way to go because uh, you look at individual elements, mobile, we definitely need to give them more spectrum to make robust networks. We need to do uh, set up more of optic fiber. Our optic fiber is only one tenth of that of China, one fourteenth of that of USA. We have a long way to go there. Our towers, we have to fiberize to 80 to 100 percent. For 5G, they say even 100 percent is required, minimum is 80 percent. And you look at us, we are with 30 percent, we got challenges. Both China and USA are 80 to 90 percent. So there also we need to improve. Public Wi-Fi hotspots, we are only at 0.3 million. We need to go to, before end of this year, we are supposed to be at 5 million. So there, all these are good challenges before us. We have done this before, so I'm sure we'll meet these also. So that's what my view of digital infrastructure is. Data centers, of course, have to mushroom also to cope with the 5G explosion of data. Thank you. Thank you, TV. I think you have brought out a very holistic uh, picture of uh, what constitutes digital infrastructure. And importantly, a very important input before we can have the benefit of 5G services really coming into play. Thanks a lot, TV. And I'll now turn my attention uh, to Balaji. Balaji is a very popular figure amongst all of us. He is also the voice of the consumer. He represents uh, Vodafone as the single largest in, uh, foreign investment which he has brought into the country as faith and commitment to India. I think it's uh, really uh, something which one would like to hear, Balaji, from a consumer's perspective, that now that we are talking of 5G coming in, could you see the competitiveness in, you know, Indian markets, Balaji, are very sensitive. Consumers are very sensitive to prices. 5G is going to have its associated costs. What is your assessment of the consumer reactions to the sensitive sensitivity of pricing in 5G? And do you believe there are any important regulatory initiatives which are required? Over to you. Thank you, Umang. I think it's always a pleasure to be with you and so many wonderful uh, panelists, very, very eminent. Uh, and thanks, uh, ET, for getting us all together. Uh, very, very relevant question, uh, Umang. I think uh, the stage has been set by previous speakers and yourself. There are lessons to be learned about India in the last 25 years. If you've had ubiquitous coverage of uh, mobile telephony uh, at population scale, at, at speeds undreamt of anywhere in the world, it's because uh, a lot of innovation has taken place in deployment strategies, in rolling out networks in making sure that there were products that were designed uh, for India and Amit represents the technology uh, side of the telecom sector that contributed there significantly. Um, and so whether it's business model innovations in terms of uh, managed services where, uh, you know, the, 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 the organizations that were focused on uh, maintaining the networks that best knew about it, start to focus on it, whether it's the, uh, Tower sharing initiatives that have taken place, which is what uh, uh, you know has become uh, the kind of things that today uh, case studies are written about and is being done in Europe today. Yeah, 
So it happened 10 years back in India. So a bunch of things have happened um, in India in terms of uh, business innovations and technology innovations, which made sure that we could have affordable uh, services available to masses. And that's why we have, uh, you know, voice networks, which kind of reached uh, the, uh, the length and breadth of the country. Uh, same thing has happened in terms of broadband in the last seven to eight years. Uh, broadband networks of 3G, 4G, again, followed the similar model of making sure that use the assets that you have. Uh, if you have 2G towers, just make sure that you kind of uh, mount the antennas of 3G on them. Make sure that you could share those resources in order to make sure that you can have affordable uh, services offered to uh, consumers. And that's why the uptake has been tremendous and we've got the largest what? data uh, country in the world. And so I think uh, the, the affordability uh, formula by A, building a strong ecosystem, by building strong partnerships, by each uh, element or each player in the ecosystem focusing on their core competence and by focusing on um, business and technology innovations uh, is how we've kind of gotten there and includes the devices play where you ended up having devices that are extremely cheap and made in India for making sure they were affordable. Uh, clearly on 5G issues will be the same that if you want to make it uh, mass scale because it has a huge, huge impact on uh, on the life of society at large. The impact is to your point and what ET is rightly pointed out revolutionary. So it's going to have huge impact on industry verticals across every sector, whether it's manufacturing or whether it's services and uh, whether it's individuals or enterprises, all of them are going to be uh, positively impacted. Now, if you want to make sure that you kind of bring the benefits of that to uh, again to population scale, then it's extremely important that uh, affordability uh, is a focus there. And how do you make things more affordable? By making sure that you, you know, scrunch the whole uh, cost structure dramatically. If we are talking about, and the government is talking about, in fact, the prime minister is talking about a five trillion economy in the next few years. He's also articulated along with the minister and the regulator, the dream for a one trillion digital economy. That's gonna happen. Uh, because there's a huge multiplier effect of setting those digital networks that TV talked about and Mr. Uh, Kishore Babu mentioned, right? Now, if you've got to do all of that, then clearly the role of uh, telecom as an enabler for economical growth and an astronomical uh, you know, increase in the startup ecosystem and the value creation and our value unlocking for our country requires that in the telecom sector is then viewed uh, as a partner and not necessarily uh you know for kind of drawing revenues out of the sector and that would mean affordable uh, prices for spectrum uh, affordable tax structure if today 33 percent of our taxes go into uh, various levies then that needs to come down no question about it um, at least for a foreseeable future where investment cycles are going to be huge it's extremely important that those taxes and levies are addressed again ndcp policy talks about it needs to be addressed a right of way cannot be on a rent seeking basis um, and therefore it has to be on an affordable basis. Time to market is extremely critical and time to market would mean, uh, you know, uh, instant uh, or quick decision making when it comes to right of way. What TV talked about getting 80% of towers to be fiberized, then again requires investment and requires a uh, quick rapid rollout. So these are things that in my mind are very important. And one other facet that I'd like to mention here, when we talk about uh, opportunities uh, in terms of uh, massive IoT deployment or high, broad, high bandwidth broadband or low latency industry vertical applications, then clearly uh, it is important for us to use all the assets that we've created. Therefore, extremely important that India adopts the, uh, what is traditionally called non-standalone mode of 5G, which means if you have 5G, it should be in a position to use the existing 4G networks as a fallback. And that is the way you make sure that affordability and migration starts to happen in a smooth manner. 2G, 4G, 5G need to coexist as long as consumers want them to coexist, right? And therefore, the non-standard, non-standalone mode of 5G is extremely important to address the affordability uh, uh, parameter that Umang you so rightly talked about. So summarizing everything in a manner that I've only brought those facets that are uh, important from an affordability point of view, that is the uh, voice of the consumer. And therefore all of us, whether it's regulator, whether it's the um, 
uh, whether it's the policy maker, whether it's us as operators, whether it's the tower companies, whether it's the technology providers or the devices players, all of us have a role to play in order to make sure that affordable services in order to catapult India to the next level takes place very quickly. Thank you and back to you, Man. Yeah, thank you, Balaji. I think it was very comprehensive and particularly your emphasis on partnerships, on core competencies and on the development of the ecosystem so that from a consumer perspective, he gets the benefit of affordability. And at the same time, we widen our space and have a massification. Thank you very much, uh, Balaji. I'll turn our attention now to Mr. Amit Marwa with uh, Amit's company, Nokia. We have a special affiliation because yes. Nokia was the first company which started the mobile networks in India, in Calcutta. So uh, this is something which we will always remember and record, that it is the Nokia network which originated the first mobile call. Amit Marwa is the proud representative of that company. And uh, I would request you to talk about not what happened, but what will likely to happen. I think when we talk of the last 25 years, let's also look at the next 25 years. And from that point of view, while we have been very focused on connectivity and uh, people connectivity, how do you see the next 25 years in terms of growth with things to things, with more and more um, IoT devices, more and more connectivity, so that we really become connected in the holistic sense of the term. Over to you, Amit. Thank you, sir. And um, yes, proud to be part of the first uh, company which did the first call with the first phone, but also very proud to have shared the stage with you and TV and Balaji, who were in some sense uh, at that time part of that uh, journey. In fact, uh, Duaji probably you also. Uh, so so, so it's, a, it's a great moment, I think. 25 years has been extremely good for Nokia and for the country. And we hope that 5G will take us to the next, as we say, revolution. Uh, coming to the topic that you talked about, and I think you, you know, everybody's talked about uh, innovation and you know the digital infrastructure, etc. Uh, devices, I agree, play a very, very important role uh, because that becomes the endpoint enabler of what uh, will have when we're saying, you know, from billions to multi billions or trillions of devices getting connected. Uh, through the IoT machine that 5G will enable. Uh, IoT as a subject is also possible in 4G, so there is a misconception that IoT or Industry 4.0 can only happen in 5G. It will get accelerated in 5G, and that is true. Uh, but having said that, 4G also provides the platform to be able to do that. Uh, now, coming to the devices that we use today versus the devices that would be required in the future when 5G really happens, there is a little bit of a difference. And if I characterize those devices into maybe two or three buckets, one are the conventional mobile devices like we use today. Uh, the other is a huge percentage of what we call fixed wireless devices, which means that more and more broadband homes, which are right now dependent on some kind of wired connectivity will go wireless. So there will be a huge upsurge of devices which will be required for doing fixed wireless connectivity. And then comes the others category, which has, you know, the where the numbers of millions and billions of devices will come into play, which includes the sensors, which will go into vehicles, into vending machines, into washing machines, into refrigerators, into cameras, into USB modes, into MiFi devices. And these sensors will be of different types, different requirements for different type of machine that would require it. Some may require a very sophisticated low latency sensor, which would be required for say connected vehicles. Some may require absolutely a very dumb or very, very cheap device, which goes into smart meters, where you need to just send one signal every you know, few, few weeks. So the requirement of devices will become more and more varied and more, more, more and more technical. I think I was looking at the GSMA study today, which said that only about 40 to 45 percent of what will be the devices, even in the next five years that they're looking at, will be the mobile devices that we are talking about today. Uh, the rest, 20 percent or more, will come from fixed wireless, and then the balance, 35, 40 percent, is coming from this massive machine-to-machine -machine kind of connection, which will happen in the future. 
So that is the categorization of the devices. And the last part is on the availability of the devices. So again, I was looking at this report a few days back. Uh, even if you just look at the mobile devices, uh, today there are about 306 mobile devices and fixed wireless devices, according to GSMA, available right now on 5G. And this report I saw was June 2020. I pulled out the same report of August 2020, so June, July, August, two months, that number from 306 has gone up to 364. So you can see the pace at which the device ecosystem is developing extremely, extremely fast. And I'm sure that by the time we, uh, we are ready to launch 5G in India, this will mature even further and the affordability of these devices will be apt for the India market. Thank you. In fact, uh, Amit, in one of our previous conferences, we had heard some colleagues from the technology group mentioning that, uh, you know, I'm talking about a few years ago, that they had talked of about 50 billion devices, as what they perceived in the next so many years. Yeah. And more recently, when we heard Mr. Sanjay Malik of Nokia talking, he said several trillions of dollars, uh, tr tr trillions of devices will be uh, coming up in that uh, 25 years yeah. that he mentioned. I think when we were talking about 50 billion, we were looking at five years from now. So we were talking 2025. Now we are saying 25 to 30 to 50 years from now. So that multiplies exponentially, I would say. Quite extraordinary. Yeah. Thank you, Amit. So my old and close associate, Duaji, is there. He is the Director General of Taipur, and he has been closely associated with the creation of the telecom tower infrastructure and the sharing story. Duaji, as you know, um, in the NDCP, it is perceived that as we get into broadband, the backhaul will play a very key role. And the, if I'm not mistaken, NDCP talks of achieving 60 to 65 percent fiberization of towers as compared to our existing estimate of 25 to 30 percent. It's like doubling. And as we move into a 5G environment, it is possible that that 60% may actually be mo moving more towards about 80% of towers to be fiberized. It's undoubtedly a very massive task ahead, given the fact that we are somewhere close to only 30% presently. And we know the federal structure and the processes of approvals and so on. So from a practical assessment, how do you see that we can rapidly uh, build up our backhaul and uh, this fiber-based uh, whether that is the answer or there are alternate answers, any good perspective from your side? So please unmute yourself. Dwaji, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Thanks, Sumang, as usual, moderating very professionally. Uh, I'm delighted to be in the company of, you know, uh, a mix, you know, you have the policy maker, you have the empire and the regulator, you have the equipment guys, you have uh, our Guruji, that is TV Ramachandran, and uh, as usual, Balaji, the telecom expert, both on the mobility and devices and whatnot. I think is a, a very valid question that you raised. I think I'm, I'm as usual, if I'm coming toward the end, which you call in the cricket term as the night watchman, though I have the umpire coming at the end to give his last word, who will come at the last word. I think if you talk of uh, 5G, and if you're thinking of 100 uh, times that of the speed of the 4G, I think nothing, will serve purpose other than the fiberization of the whole thing. And as for evolution, we have seen, we have seen evolution if you look back uh, before 1994, I think maybe Amit may not remember, uh, Balaji will remember, TV will remember, we started with a Strouger exchange, if you recollect, and then we went into the, you know, Nokia exchanges and then the, the digital exchanges and the line exchanges and O OCB 283, and then you know, as we migrated from 2G, 3G, 4G, now coming back to 5G, in the present situation, if you look at it, has both the demand and supply situation. 
now demand is many many megabits being asked the present situation and it will continue to be that in the pandemic and covid 19 but this is on the demand side on the supply side you still lack the devices you still lack the fiberization and you still do not have even the fiber on the board itself recently even fcc delayed this auction because of this and they went into july i think july they have made this auction now as of now if you think if you look at there are 31 percent towers which are fiberized and if you compare with the over 80 percent in case of countries like us south korea china thankfully i think thankfully i think uh, architect of ndcp our friend kishore babu who has very clearly uh, laid out and notified several enabling measures to achieve the desired fiberization if you look at that chapter there so again there is another transformational uh, document which came is the national broadband mission rolled out it just as recently in december and at certainly and certainly at the state level we are having almost every weekly one review meeting with, uh, with the help of dot with all the states to check the row status also to check the tower installation also to check the fiberization this is the kind of session your question very rightly says okay what happens if the towers are not fiberized well uh, you have already allocation the tra has already uh, uh, given the recommendation on the env spectrum most countries have already freed up this kind of spectrum and large chunks of this bandwidth from 60 gigahertz to 86 gigahertz for ultra high capacity backhaul application have been freed up but this among and my colleagues and there is going to be a very very temporary solution it's not going to meet the requirement that we are envisaging 100 megabits and latency of as low as less than uh, less than a second i think we need to have a fiber update. to this extent this is one part that the uh, env band to be available on the second side i think uh, the what is required is a gis mapping needs to be done on the ofc which is also envisaged in the ndcp with that you will have the you know we will avoid duplication of putting the fiber itself you will have the exact figures available in this also i like to tell each one of you the dot has already appointed a consultant to go into this detail and find out and do the gis mapping as recent as the day before we had a discussion on that that is one part then there has to be on a dig once policy which is very important because you need to have one policy dig once policy or call up and the policy so that there is one fiber which is laid and with the help of the micro ducting others can use it then the implementation of the row policy which has great challenges you know with all the efforts of the dot with all the efforts of the state with all the efforts of the lsa we've been able to achieve 16 states on board who have done this exercise and there are another 12 states which are likely to do it there are many things which suggested can be one is immediately you can make use of the bharat net the uso fund guys should be told to do that and there is also a, also clause formation of the uh, fiber authority in the country that is required if you make that that will at least give you this policy which is required now on the national broadband mission if you look at and which it is a huge huge i think uh, objective that we have 20 uh, 50 lakhs kilometer of the cable then two and a half times the tower to be fiberized on that therefore mapping which is become you need to map up the whole thing today you don't know x has how much laid out the fiber b y how much laid out fiber so therefore it's a once the mapping is done, A, the people will know where the fiber is. Secondly, there will not be duplication. So therefore, your answer, the answer to your question is not one answer that, okay, if the fiber is not there, E and V will serve. I think it will have to be to start with a mix of both the things. As we progress towards increasing 30% of the tower to fiber, and meanwhile, if the DOT, the TRA recommendation, if we are lying for a long time in the DOT, if I understand correctly, 
they should be formulated and they will be formalized to free that spectrum. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dwaji. I think you have rightly suggested a mix of solutions. There is no one-stop uh, issue. It, there are multiple challenges and we have to face them with uh, a multi-pronged approach. And I think that's what you are hinting at. Very well said. Gupta ji, uh, are you audible? Am I audible to you? You are audible to me. I don't know whether I am audible to you or not. <laughs> uh, audible. Welcome to you. Welcome. Thank very you very much. That, uh, the, the technology and the system is working maybe later than sooner, but then so what? You are there with us now. Thank you very Gupta much. Ji, but I only that I have missed certain portions which I could not hear. So maybe no, that uh, when I have it is the overlapping or there are certain patterns. I think the whole point is that sometimes instead of being the opening batsman, if you are at the other end of it, you have the benefit of a viewpoint. And I think that is what uh, is the advantage. See, we have heard uh, about uh, some of the challenges which are associated with setting up an infrastructure if we go the 5G route. We are also noticing that uh, 5G worldwide has already been introduced. There are, uh, I believe, of the order of uh, 82 commercial networks, and there are about 120 million subscribers already there. So it's not that uh, 5G on a worldwide basis has already set its pace. As far as India is concerned, given the situation and the environment which uh, you've had uh, your own understanding as also what the comments of my colleagues are how do you see the prospects for 5g in india mm. uh, thank you mr umang for giving me an opportunity to share my views on this particular platform and pardon me for uh, repeating anything which has already been told because i could join only about uh, 20 25 minutes later than the session has started because of technical glitch so i'm very sorry for that uh, your question is very very valid and at many forums this issue is raised that why we are getting late on 5g in india and uh, what needs to be done and whether we can catch up with the other uh, world leaders on the 5g and whatnot now i will start with the very basic what are the 5g use cases broadly speaking one can say okay it's an enhanced broadband access means an individual can get a very high speed of the broadband one can say massive machine type communication means IoT in short, the machine will talk to each other rather than man talking to each other, which happens as of now. And third is ultra reliable low latency communications where we talk about that uh, communication delays will be very, very low and therefore we can do things online like uh, many foreign countries are talking of driverless cars and whatnot and uh, there are various applications in India also. Now let us examine these use cases in Indian scenario. Are we really requiring 5G? So let us go to the use cases and then you will get answer that whether we require or not. In COVID, you would have seen that the demand of the bandwidth has increased and all the telecom networks are overlaid by about 10 to 15%. So it very clearly confirms that there is a demand. Demand is not coming from one particular sector. Demand is coming from across the sectors whether you talk about health, you talk about finance, you talk about education, you talk about entertainment, you talk about office purpose. So uh, you talk about conference, you talk about uh, uh, sharing of the various meetings, etc. So there is a huge demand. There is no doubt about it. Now, thirdly, how are we going to meet to this particular demand, whether 4G is capable to meet all the demands? one thing is very important it is not only demand but the quality of service and you would have noticed that the quality of service in today's world is a challenge and there are a lot of complaints are coming i am not against the telecom service providers but the nature and the uh, uh, you know spot in the demand itself is difficult to be matched with the existing technology Optical fiber penetration, Mr. Dua has very rightly pointed out that there are problems and optical fiber penetration is not that good to some extent. Therefore, it definitely requires a technology which can have fixed wireless access sort of uh, uh, things where I can meet the demand of the people directly using the 5G technology. So there is a demand and different verticals are using it. Then come on other things like e-commerce is going very fast. We are moving towards virtual reality or augmented reality and whether augmented reality or virtual reality can be provided by the 4G 
definitely not. And we had to look towards the 5G. So all these cases, either we talk about industrial revolution 4.0 or we could talk about IoT or talk about uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, high speed data, etc. This all points that sooner the better if we move to the 5G technologies. Then what is the delay and why we are not able to move there? So the, the first question comes, is the ecosystem ready to support the 5G? Now, for the people who are attending the webinar, I will like to sell 5G is primarily looking into the interface between the user and the first stage like BTS or Node V or whatsoever we want to say. It will be that first stage where it will be communicating. Therefore, unless you have a very strong backbone, the results of 5G, what we expect would not come. What we expect by the strong backbone, either it should be connected by the optical fiber or we have the high speed wireless. Unfortunately, country at this point of time is neither having a very high density of the optical fiber, nor we are having V band or E band access where we can have a very fat pipe on the wireless. Therefore, if 5G has to be implemented, whatsoever we want to do, we had to do it so that at least wireless spectrum is made available which is E band and V band so that the fat pipe can be created which can serve the purpose otherwise 5G will have no meaning at all number one. Number second comes the device ecosystem. I completely agree with Mr. Amit that device ecosystem has developed and large number of devices are there and they are also uh, getting affordable. But India is a very, very price sensitive market. And I want to put a word of caution, please don't compromise on device quality. If we compromise on the device quality, we are going to compromise on the quality of service in future. We have done certain mistakes in past, such mistakes should not be repeated in future because interference which results from the devices very strongly impact the quality of service and which becomes very, very difficult to handle at the later stage to go on. Secondly, the quality of service as of now, which we have been providing in the 4G networks has a huge concern. We, uh, it's a chicken and egg situation. Many times we are telling that we don't have proper uh, revenue models and because of that, we cannot afford to give much higher quality of service. There are other uh, side of people who are telling that we are not getting good quality. We are ready to pay much higher prices for the good quality. And therefore, I think we had to have a balance where a very good quality can be given. And uh, network slicing is one of the answers for that, particularly in the 5G network. So we should ensure that good quality is given to the individuals. Our responsibility is also very high because now telecom has become a critical infrastructure and growth of various economic verticals depend on the telecommunication networks per se. And therefore, it is our duty to ensure that we enhance the quality of the telecom networks and services to the individuals in times to come. Now, uh, rather 5G is a thing which can be implemented by only telecom service providers. My understanding is that it's a different ball game. It's a ecosystem which would be driving the 5G, though I completely agree that certain uh, functions on the 5G network, like providing high speed uh, connectivity to the individuals can be done by the telecom service providers. But many of the advantages which are particularly related to 5G will be driven with the ecosystem. There are sensors, there are app providers, there are system integrators, there are telecom service providers. So all has to work in cohesion. Then many times, as you have also pointed out, that there are countries who have adopted 5G. We have not adopted 5G. 5G is basically a game of use cases. What are the use cases? And I will like to flag here that use cases of all the countries may not be same. Use case of India may be very, very different than the use cases of the other country. So this is not the area where we can simply copy the experience of the other countries and start providing the similar services and expect that this will be success for the 5G. 
I am giving a word of caution that no, it may not happen. As far as initiatives taken, TRI has given recommendation for the uh, uh, price of the spectrum, uh, which is under consideration of the government. Uh, we have also recommended for test bed and many test bed have been created. Ecosystem is also getting developed, including telecom service provider and other people who are testing different applications. And I am thrilled to share with you that large number of uh, India specific applications have also been developed. And I'm quite optimistic that uh, 5G will have a much uh, better uh, future in India uh, as a whole. Working of all these stakeholders together will bring the fruits for us. Uh, my sense is implementation of 5G in India would be in the form of overlay. There will be certain area which will have higher requirement than the others and it will spread subsequently. Overlay could start from the industry development. It can start from the uh, uh, revolution of the smart cities. It can be in the different areas where there is a high demand of the bandwidth and there may be various other uh, use cases, but it will slowly, slowly start from few pockets where it will spread and ultimately it will be uh, covering all the uh, country. So with these words, I hope that 5G would be the future for the telecommunication. It is very much required in Indian networks. It will be provided in the Indian network, but there are certain cautions which has to be taken care of if we want to be successful after implementation of 5G and ensure that the real fruits of 5G reaches to the masses. Thank you very much, Mr. Umang. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, SK Sub. It was a very comprehensive and a very well thought through of what are the realities of the Indian sector. We all want 5G, there is a demand for 5G, but at the same time, the readiness of the ecosystem, the readiness of the infrastructure to support it, I think these are, in fact, they, they come prior. Unless and until that is there, the true fruit of benefit cannot come. And therefore, you are adopt, suggesting a step-by-step -step approach, which is also very valid. Thank you very much, SK Sab. Kishore Babu, I will uh, turn your attention to another question, uh, which is that, you know, all said and done, the NDCP is a very well thought through document. It has uh, gone through several iterations, a lot of industry connect, a lot of consultation processes. This document was well approved uh, at the highest level in the government of India. It is a document of 2018. What is your perception? Why is implementation held up particularly when we are realizing that many other things are very much dependent on an ecosystem and a, and a creation of a infrastructure where stuff like uh, fiber fiber authority of india stuff like uh, uh, rapid you know pull out these are things which are built into the policy perspective i think the intent is very much there but somewhere along the line it's taking us a little bit longer. What is your perception, sir? Thank you, Mengji. You have asked the most complicated question in a very simplistic way. <laughs> so, in fact, I don't mean the, uh, as you all remember, uh, when we started deliberating about uh, NDCP provisions, what should be the roadmap between uh, 2018 to 2022? And uh, I recall very much, try how much they supported it. They gave a lot of inputs during the formulation of the draft policies. And you also helped in giving the use cases as well as the scenarios internationally, how, what could be the way forward in uh, building the, very much what you told about uh, digital infrastructure, fiberization, Wi-Fi, rural connectivity and all these areas. Uh, yes, one is about uh, the NDCP, as you all know, it's approved by Union Cabinet and uh, provisions are very clear about what should be the way forward, what's the vision for uh, Indian digital telecommunications landscape. Uh, however, when it came to implementation or bringing out the provisions into the directions or actions, I can say assuringly that there are a few which are already implemented. There are a few which are already in, I should say that, you know, in the certain final stages where, you know, implementation could be a matter of time or, you know, declaration could be a matter of time because uh, final literacies are getting addressed. And there are a few cases which are still being studied because uh, certain things, uh, more inputs uh, to arrive on those friends. A few cases which I want to share with you, which, you know, took uh, a big pace 
uh, with regard to experimentation as well as R&D of the spectrum. And we all know that uh, uh, almost like, unlock your device, sir. please excuse me, mobile is speaking automatically nowadays, like Alexa, okay. So uh, I was mentioning about, you know, experimentation as well as R&D framework for giving spectrum. Uh, all along, you may be knowing that, you know, when we introduce that provision, especially with regard to demonstration, experimentation, R&D, as well as technology trials, because we all agree that these are some of the important uh, fundamental building blocks to enable 5G in building India-specific and relevant usage cases where you need to encourage R&D, give them enough spectrum to do the, you know, indoor testing as well as uh, maturing the product. Uh, thanks to all of you for your inputs. It was an exercise of almost six months from uh, 2019 January to 2019 July. Finally, in uh, July, we brought out this uh, experimental framework policy, which categorically brought out what way we should enable spectrum availability for indoor in R&D, uh, and as well as testing, manufacturing, as well as for the demonstration, technology trials purposes. And in fact, through this uh, webinar, I know that you know many of you are already aware I still want to, you know, convey the message to the, you know, large audience here. Uh, some of you may still may not be aware. Uh, for testing wireless products in your lab, now it has been made more simplified way. Through self-declaration, you can get the spectrum. You need not uh, go through the elaborate approval process with mere 5,000 rupees per year. You can uh, get this uh, license for any kind of, uh, you know, quantum of spectrum for doing in... Uh, non-interference, non-protection mode. You can get the spectrum and you can do in your lab, in your campuses, you can do that with just 5,000 rupees and also through self-declaration. It's one of the very radical way. It's available only in few countries in the world. Let me assure you that. Even some of the developed countries require a lot of approval process to give experimental spectrum within indoors. For indoor testing and R&D, as well as for manufacturing and as well as for providing your test beds. It is just, I know that, you know, some of the, Industry captains in industry, they have already established test beds using this provision, which allows you to establish a test bed, use as much amount of spectrum you need. It's a just 5,000 rupees per spectrum band for a two year period. For manufacturing, you get the spectrum through self declaration. And for demonstration indoor, you get the spectrum through self declaration. Yes, only in the cases of outdoor uh, testing as well as uh, outdoor technology trials where you have to do certain cooperation, collaboration because there may be other licensed. Uh, I know, I mean, uh, applications which may be working. So this is one of the very radical transformational spectrum offering framework, which has already been uh, uh, implemented and, uh, you know, through the approval of the Digital Communication Commission. Once again, thanks for all your inputs. And other areas like when you mentioned about uh, making public Wi-Fi, we have the, you know, I mean, uh, significant uh, inputs from TRI in terms of the recommendations, in terms of for fiberization, and in fact, ENV band, that way, if it is, uh, you can call it as administrative allocation of spectrum and pricing. And uh, to promote other areas, manufacturing and R&D, we have prior recommendations available with us, as well as industry inputs have been taken. I repeat once again, because things are in uh, evolving and final stages, perhaps it may not be appropriate for me to share the nitty gritties right now. But then in final stages, I can assure that everything is being done from Department of Telecom to bring shape in terms of direction, as well as policy framework to take forward industry interest as well to convey, to take Digital India program to the masses. And uh, one more thing, what I want to add, you know, taking this opportunity is about, uh, uh, Department of Telecom is also working in a very big way in, uh, in, in working very big way in, uh, you know, strengthening the standardization framework under uh, Indian National Standardization Policy Program and uh, R&D and Innovation Digital Communication Sector. You all know that in Department of Telecom earlier, uh, uh, it was worked through different agencies, CDOT as well as industry. Now there's a focus division they have established called standardization, R&D and innovation to bring focus on homegrown companies as well as uh, Indian companies who are working on R&D and standardization. And of course, with the support from uh, industry captains as well as the stakeholders. And uh, the efforts, what you told, like, you know, some of you, may, like TV are told about the importance of digital infrastructure. And uh, Balaji told about affordability of this digital infrastructure. And Amit told about, uh, you know, 5G brought out the features of 4G, which are not very used, like, you know, for Industry 4.0, as well as IoT. 
and Duwaji brought about 31 percent of fiberization and uh, Secretary Tri mentioned about the importance of usage cases. If you look at, we all speak about how we can optimally use the investments and enhance infrastructure penetration to reach the, you know, I should say the lakhs of villages which are to be covered, you know, in a way with a strong digital, uh, you know, backbone uh, infrastructure. Here comes the opportunity where what we India can contribute in the 5G standardization program. You all might have heard about LMLC as one of the uh, 5G standards, which is getting shaped up in the final stages of approval at uh, ITU. And uh, many of the Indian industry members, as well as uh, other stakeholders, supported it uh, wholeheartedly. The focus is about what way we can optimize investment in infrastructure and enhance coverage so that 5G, we can have a, what I should say, affordable, cost effective infrastructure rollout for 5G to take to masses in rural infrastructure. Yes to cover even EMVP as well as MMTC as well as your LNC kind of applications. And I fully agree with all of you that, you know, usage cases relevant for India need to be built up so that, you know, when there's a demand from Indian perspective where we can take them in a big way. But however, I also want to add another dimension to this. There are uh, applications which are relevant to India, which we need to roll up. At the same time, considering our, uh, uh, software expertise as well as you know the abilities we have built how we can build usage cases for the world because if you look at our it and ITS services which are globally you know competent as well as they're uh, renowned for their cost effective mm. solutions across the globe so here we have a great opportunity even to take our usage cases to the world not only for our uh, usage as well as abroad so with this abroad. thank you very much once again thank you very much once again thank you uh, kishore babu i think this will be a very big feather in the cap, the LMLC standard which you mentioned, which will be our India standard. Thank you. And also that uh, several steps are now being taken towards the implementation of the policy documents, steps in the right direction. Incidentally, it appears that we are running out of time and the organizers will be raising the red flag. So before we close, can I request that uh, each of our participants, particularly our industry veterans, for the benefit of uh, an understanding for Sri S.K. Gupta and Sri Kishore Babu, kind of give one or two wish list of yours, what you think needs to be done as we get into the emerging 5G environment for India. I will start with the Bhishma Pitama with the TV Ramachandran that just mention one or two, you know, which you think are important and then we will move forward and request our other colleagues to also say so that it is a good takeaway as far as our regulator and our licensor are concerned in terms of their uh, appreciation of the viewpoint of some of our veterans we are sitting together. Thank yes, you, Manji. Uh, I will not take much time. It's a very easy thing to do rather, rather than answer a deep question. Uh, so my wish list is, number one, for broadband and internet, the lifeblood is Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi hotspot. This is ubiquitous everywhere in the world, and we are, I mean, so low in penetration of public Wi-Fi hotspots, TRI has come out with excellent recommendations on that for liberalizing Wi-Fi and making it happen. I think we need to act on that because we are today, the world average is 200 times higher than us. 200 times higher than what we have in terms of Wi-Fi hotspots per pop. That's one which, which is very high in my list. Secondly, I think satellite communications has also not been tapped at all in India. We have got a brilliant TISRO making wonders in satellite area, satellite sphere. I think the commercial world must chip in, private sector must chip in now and commercialize satellite communications. You will believe it, America has got 4 million satellite broadband connections. India doesn't have even 0.1 million. So we need to go places. These are my two wish list highs. Thank you. Uma. Thank you. Balaji. Uh, thank you, Mang. I think uh, uh, two things. One is, of course, reduce the uh, uh, the burden of uh, levies and taxes, uh, and of course, uh, the spectrum costs. Uh, something which has been spoken about in NDA, NDCP just needs to happen very rapidly. Um, and second is, of course, on on uh, right of way and fiberization. If rent seeking stops there, automatically costs come down. And therefore, it's a great way to have affordable services rolled out to the masses. 
Thank you. And over to you, Amit. Um, sir, I would say number one, I think um, Gupta ji also covered EMV band, extremely important uh, because that's an alternate to fiber, must have. And the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, we have something in Nokia which is called 5G for all. And instead of now industry 4.0, uh, we have started calling it industry X. And what we mean by industry X is that we are all here debating that should we think about how 5G is going to benefit everyone. Instead, if we change the whole sentence and say that, can we think about how to make everybody benefit from 5G? And then the whole discussion will change. So industry X basically means that you are doing economic value creation along with improving health and happiness of the people at large and how 5G can, if we start thinking in that direction, so I think steps need to be taken to make industry X, whether it's industry 4.0, whether it's smart cities, enable those because individually, it's going to find a very difficult business case. So I think there is a requirement from government uh, and intervention required to enable the infrastructure and you know whatever incentives need to be given to make this happen. Thank you. And Duaji, over to you. What is your Thank view? You very much. Thank you very much, Umang. There's an old saying, if wishes were the horses, then you know what would have happened. Mm. <laughs> okay, I think, uh, you know, uh, one important wish that I continue to say and continue to highlight is uh, uh, regulator has done his job. I mean, way back, uh, right from last six, seven years, regulator and has given his recommendation, very strong recommendation on the enhancement of scope of the infrastructure providers on a very pretext that they're only giving B2B. We do not access any of the subscriber base. And the recent March 13 recommendation come, I think, I think uh, excellent recommendation. And they're still, we are pursuing with that. And it, it is the right time to do that because if you want to bring a huge investment into the huge investment into the industry, fiber a, a time to go to market, and also implementation of the new technologies that are coming in. I'm not saying who can invest more, but as an IP investor, we are ready to invest into all these. And the second one is equally important, but more than that, which I said is is the creation of the fiber authority. Under that pretext, probably you will achieve what I earlier said is the fiber is the only thing which can facilitate all these technologies, what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. You can have devices, you can have spectrum, you can have everything in the world that is very, unless you put this into the place, it will be a dream to achieve. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. SKG, you wanted to say something? Yeah, just very short uh, intervention. Uh, I think uh, two things is very, very important, which I would like to emphasize. One, which Mr. Dua has said, it's very important because unless we create the partnership and enhance the participation of the infrastructure provider, we should forget about uh, putting a lot of optical fiber on the grounds. Only telecom service provider cannot do this particular job for a big country like India. So that's one big priority which has to be considered, number one. Number second, I completely agree with Mr. Uh, TV that we are not effectively utilizing the satellite communication in India. We have given uh, two very important recommendations to reduce the usage price of the backhaul for the satellite. And I hope that that will be accepted on priority basis by the Department of Telecommunication, which will ease the way in some way. You know, if really we want to provide a very good services, we have to use the uh, satellite in a very big manner because the various corners and the uh, places which are difficult to reach can be covered quickly only by satellite communication and nothing else. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, as your moderator, I'm actually supposed to moderate, but I will still uh, give my wish list also. and. Uh, if I may say just one wish list, I feel that with the upcoming 5G environment, we as a telecom industry or the digital industry will be the infrastructure provider to the entire sector, all, whether it is uh, 
health, education, finance, whatever. So we have to be very unified in our approach. We need to have a consensus approach. We cannot afford to have uh, too much variances, which will then not enable decision making. I think the need of the hour is rapid decision making may not be the best of decisions, but it will at least make us move forward. So I think as long as we view ourselves as one, as an industry infrastructure provider to the whole of the country for all its different things, I think we as a digital economy will continue to uh, miss the boat. We should not. We should be accelerated in our efforts. We are all very clear. Everybody is thinking the right way. Let's make it happen. Thank you very much. Maybe 5G will be our pointer for this. I also want to say that uh, thanks to the audience, we have several questions with, uh, sitting with us. I don't think it will be fair for us to pick up just one or two of them. All of them are very valid questions. I will request the organizers to pass it on to, to us and we will attempt to respond not only in the context of our discussions today, but to try and see that all the valid questions which are relevant to our discussions in 5G and its growth strategy will definitely be responded upon. But I'm sorry to say that right now we do not seem to have that much time. So we will have to say bye bye and I must thank each of the participants. I have no business to summarize what you have said because you yourself have brought it out very well in terms of what is the overall wish list. And I believe this is the way forward for all of us as one team together servicing the needs of the country. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey everyone, we still have a video left from Nokia's side. We'd like to play that. Please oh, yes. stay Please on for that. the video. Yeah, I missed that. Please do that. Nokia has been adapting to the needs of an ever-changing world for over 155 years. From a single paper mill operation in 1865, Nokia has nurtured success over the years in a range of industrial sectors. Today, Nokia creates the technology to connect the world. In India, Nokia has been connecting people since 1995, the year when Indian telecom history was written and the first GSM call was made on a Nokia handset over a Nokia network. From enabling growth of the 2G technology, bringing high quality 3G services, pioneering 4G, to now steering India towards the 5G revolution, we have been an integral part of 25 years of mobile telephony in India. With an unmatched quality of products and services, 15,000 workforce, and a presence in almost all major telecom circles, Nokia currently leads the market share in the industry. Every single call in India touches a Nokia network element somewhere in the complete call flow. Today, four telecom operators rely on us to provide high quality and far-reaching telecommunication. We also supply telecom infrastructure to the Indian Defence and Indian Railways and the Kolkata Metro. Our India presence goes beyond our customer operations, with manufacturing facilities in Chennai, global delivery centers in Noida and Chennai, and the R&D center in Bangalore, making India a global hub of innovation in telecommunication services and products for Nokia. We take pride in aligning ourselves with the Make in India mission and have invested over 2,200 crores in driving value creation in India. Our Chennai factory, established in 2008, is the largest telecom manufacturing facility in the country and is spread over 140,000 square meters. It manufactures all telecom equipment across technologies and was the first to manufacture 5G radio in the country. It is also India's first Industry 4 enabled factory. Today, 50% of the production is exported to over 100 countries. Our Bangalore R&D Center is one of the four global R&D sites for the company. It harnesses local talent for research in various global advanced telecommunication technologies such as cloud, big data analytics, IP, optical and 5G. Nokia is also committed to developing communities in India. 
making over 1 million population in 350 villages disaster resilient and aiming to bring the benefits of broadband to 500 villages in an integrated digital ecosystem. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for thank you. sir. Bye bye.